Good evening. Welcome to True Talks Live. This is a live stream talk show series to provide new perspectives for project management. The show is co-sponsored by PMI Southern Maryland and PMI WDC. I am Beth May, and I am delighted to be your MC tonight. Please note that tonight's show is being recorded and will be available later on YouTube. Our topic for tonight is systems thinking. While there may be no definitive source for the definition of systems thinking, I like the brief description offered by one of our guests in his 2015 paper called What is Systems Thinking? That definition is a perspective, a language, and a set of tools. It focuses on the relationships among system components. It's important to pause here and recognize that we're not just talking about IT systems. We're talking about a huge range of systems, including human design systems. These include IT systems, as well as systems with no technology components, and natural systems, such as the solar system and the human body. Tonight, we'll get some useful insight into how to think about these systems in a holistic way and why we want to do that. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge our producer, Dan Stay. Dan is the man behind the camera, so to speak, making show business magic. Dan will also be monitoring the YouTube chat for your questions and comments. Our True Talks host is Kendall Lott. Kendall is the CEO and president of Empowered Strategies, host of the podcast, PM Point of View, and co-founder and chairman of the board for the nonprofit Project Management for Change. Kendall has hosted this show since its inception two years ago. His no, guests are Dr. Jamie Monat and Harry Zolkauer. Please note that we had planned to have Professor Susan Parente as a guest, but she is unable to participate tonight. Thank you, Harry, for filling in. Dr. Monet is a director and professor of practice at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. He performs research and teaches several courses, including systems thinking, system optimization, and operations risk management. Previously, Dr. Monet served as president of Harvard Clinical Technology and has served in multiple corporate roles. He is also co-author of the book, Using Systems Thinking to Solve Real-World Problems. Harry Zolkauer is the president for PMI Southern Maryland, creative and executive producer of True Talks Live, and an engagement delivery manager at Salesforce. He is also the director of the Continuous Value Delivery Program at Project Management for Change. Kendall, over to you. Hey there, and thank you, Beth. Thanks for the uh, introductions and all that. And uh... I'm glad we finally were able to get off the ground here today. We may have to shorten ourselves up just a little bit on the other end, but you know, that's what happens with volunteer efforts. And that's that's where we're at uh, for here for both our chapters. So welcome everybody who's listening in, and particularly if you're from either of our home chapters that are co-sponsoring today, Southern Maryland and, sorry, running into a little chair problem here, Southern Maryland and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so audience. Uh, it may have sounded familiar. You should have some familiarity with what you just heard about here today that Beth just talked to you about because I have the guest for, and uh, you've met the topic as well for those of you who have long memories or the ability to you know, search YouTube. Uh, you may be able to recall that on April 4th, our number eight True Talks uh, was on systems change, which is a related topic to systems thinking. Systems change with Dr. Domenico Lepore and Harry Zolkauer who you will hear again from tonight, uh, who will help anchor some of our discussions tonight. So you've heard something similar. It's very important for us. Project management is inherently a system and in, embeds itself within systems. Um, and uh, yeah, as Beth said, not just IT, there's a broad range of how we can think of systems broadly uh, and generally. So why this, why now? At the end of our November webcast, number 15, uh, we had, which was on risk, uh, risk and uncertainty. We had a virtual cast party at the end of the show. We always hang out and talk a little bit to see what we might improve and, and how things went. And after the show, um, Susan uh, Prente and Dr. Mona both got talking about how the whole system of things was what was actually really interesting for them as they extended beyond thinking about risk. We're like, well, y'all want to yak about it. Let's get back on here and talk about it because 
as Beth mentioned, uh, Dr. Monat has actually written a paper on this that was published in 2015, academic publish, uh, academically published, What is System Thinking in the American Journal of Systems Science? So it was time for a callback. And there we have it. So, Jamie, are you out there hanging out? I don't hear him, however. I see him. You're looking good. I, I'll say that. You're looking good. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Ah, and I got you now. All right. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see our notes here that we might want to talk about. So, um, first of all, how are you doing? Uh, getting over a sickness there, I think, or a cold. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm on day six of COVID, so I'm on the mend, but uh, I still cough a little bit and I may sound a little bit hoarse, but I'm feeling much better. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another large system, and the uh, the way we approached it to try and solve it was also a large systems uh, piece of work there too, right? Um, you know from what? I mean, pandemic's ultimately a system, right? It, it is. And while I was recovering, I was noting my own immune system's response to the disease. You know, so <laughs> it's fascinating. So. <laughs> Well, before we dig into some practicalities, and I know we want to get to that because people like to be able to say, how do I apply this? Um, I can't help but want to play in the abstraction a little bit. When we looked at your paper, I looked at your paper and I urge everyone, I hope we can get a link to it because it's a very readable paper and it covers the literature. It literally is asking what have other people said about it and what can we conclude from how people discussed it? That, that was my takeaway from the purposes of the paper. Um, but you really hit some stuff on there that I thought was really, really important. And uh, a perspective, a language, a set of tools Yes, uh, is what you ended up highlighting there. Um, I'm going to throw out a couple of things and see which part of these you found the most interesting you'd like to speak to a little bit here tonight. So here is what uh, the good doctor told us about systems here. It is the opposite of linear thinking. I'll let that ponder, sink in. It is holistic or integrative versus analytic or dissective. So holistic versus analytic. It recognizes repeated events or patterns that come from systemic structures. So structures give us patterns, which in themselves come from, and here's the magic words, mental models. So our mental model creates systemic structures that creates patterns, and that's what we end up observing. We recognize that behaviors derive from that structure, and it's a focus on, we said behavior, right? So now we're at relationships. It's beginning to sound familiar to the project management space for sure and has an appreciation of self-organization. And that's going to come up a little bit later, I think, in our practicalities. Self-organization and emergence, which those of you who saw True Talks number eight, that was a big one for Dr. Lepore, was that uh, emergence and emergent theory was important in this and self-organization. So you hit them all there. Which part do you find the most difficult for people to grasp or the, the core one that like they need, if they could get this, it would be helpful and unlock our thinking? I think the hardest concept, the hardest systems thinking concept for people to grasp, and the one that I happen to find most fascinating is the concept of emergence. <laughs> oh, it's emergency as well. Emergence as well. Uh. Emergence, it is. And, and the reason is that um, emergence is typically not predictable. It just mm -hmm. happens. And it happens as a result of the interrelationships, the interactions among the system components. Um, you cannot... Uh, ex uh, unless you base it on experience, you cannot base emergence, you cannot predict emergence based on the characteristics of the individual system components. For example, if you took a goose and looked at the goose, flew the goose around and observed the goose flying, you would never in a million years anticipate that when the goose got together with a bunch of its buddies, they would form a V formation. The mm. V formation is an emergent property, the result of the interactions among the various geese. Um, and I think, I think most people know that geese form into a V formation because when a goose flaps its wings, it sets off trailing vortices, a trailing vortex off of each wing. And the vortex spins around. Well, on one side of the vortex, the air is spinning up. On the other side, the air is spinning down. So the following goose is going to fo follow the goose ahead of him and is going to position himself where it's easiest to fly. And that, of course, is where the air is moving up on the outside of the trailing vortex. In other words, just outside the wingtip of the leading goose. And of course, the goose behind him is going to do the same thing, and you get this beautiful V formation. Classic example of emergence. Not predictable. 
And you have emergent properties like that in all phases of systems, natural systems and human design systems. Very, very hard to anticipate. And, and you find that people find that difficult to grasp? Or is that just the cornerstone of I – mean, I'm wondering, that sounds almost like an outcome of understanding systems rather than um, something that would help us understand how to work with systems. Or is it? If it's all emergent, no, think, good luck with that. Let's see what happens. No, no, no I think you're right. I, I, think, um, I think it's not a fundamental tool that will help us understand systems. It's an outcome mm -hmm. of systems thinking. You're right. So you want to go back to the question and, and, and have me answer yeah. it in a different way, Kendall? Well, let me ask this. What would help us understand how we can use the, the, the thinking that you've laid out there? Because you did lay out – I mean you challenged it's not analytical, for example. You challenged that it is about patterns of behavior. It is about relationships. It results in emergent, and that's important to know. Um, and it could uh, – that may be the issue. Uh, when we're doing complex things, we have to wait and see how things are emergent. We can go down that process. But I'm wondering how will we know it when we see it? When we're How looking we, at the list you gave. How will we know systems when we see it, when we look at the list that you gave it? How will you know it's a system? Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, that's a really good question because um, I have had arguments with colleagues about the definition of a system. I was talking at a conference one time and a colleague of mine said, hey, uh, what do you think about this paperclip? And I said, it's not a system. He said, yeah, it's a system. I said, what do you mean it's a system? It's, a, it's, a, it's only got one component. How can that be a system? And he said, well, <laughs> If you consider the individual molecules as components, they all interrelate to each other. And I said, that's just ridiculous. In that case, everything on the planet is a system, right? Because everything's made out of molecules. So in defining a system, people can define it any way they want. But I like to define it in a way that is most useful for, for the uh, practitioners. So my definition of a system is it's a group of interacting, interrelated, or interdependent parts that together form a unified whole in which the arrangement of those parts is significant. The system has constraints, has boundaries, and involves feedback, one of several kinds of feedback. So if you start with a system definition like that, you can make some good progress. So I would recommend starting there. Not everything is a system. You know, to a, to a carpenter, everything looks like a nail, right? Not everything is a system, and not everything can be explained using systems thinking. You talk about some of the tools uh, in your paper, and I thought that was also worth looking at, including what I've never seen, a systemogram. I don't think I've ever seen that word before. Um, yeah, but I don't like that very much. Archetypes. You didn't like that word either? Well, but you talk about some tools people might be familiar with, system archetypes, main chain infrastructures, causal loops, feedback. Uh, you talk about feedback here, right? It's, it's clear we need to have feedback. Um, yes. These tools help us understand something in the face of being presented with a system. So again, I'm trying to think of how a project manager is saying, great, how does this looking at the world as a system and using these tools help me? So okay. maybe we let can me approach it through the tools. Okay, let me see if I can adjust it that way. Um, patterns, mm. patterns exist everywhere. There are physical patterns that exist in nature. There are temporal patterns that exist in behavior. Uh, there are psychological patterns um, and what is a pattern but a repeated event or repeated something, either physical or psychological. So when something is repeated, it's a pattern. Patterns are inevitably caused by structure. So mm. when you are walking down the street and you look at a pine cone that's fallen on the ground and you pick it up and you look at it and you notice that there are spirals going around in a beautiful pattern. The spirals are going around in two directions, by the way clockwise and counterclockwise. That's caused by underlying structure. And that underlying structure is in turn caused by underlying physical forces. So one of the keys is whenever you see a pattern, try to figure out what is the underlying structure. And let me see if I can clarify that with a, 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 a useful example. You go into your boss's office and she blows up at you. And you say, okay, well, She's in a bad mood. She doesn't feel well. She had a bad day, whatever. All right. And you, you, you just mark it off. You don't think much of it. Come back the following day, go into your boss's office. She blows up at you. And it turns out that every time you go into your boss's office, she blows up at you. Now something's going on. Now it's not just random. It's not just chance. There is some underlying structure that's causing that repetitive 
pattern. And as, as a systems thinker, it's your duty to figure out what that underlying structure is. Now, what could the underlying structure be? The underlying structure could be that, well, you know, you burst in on her without knocking on the door when she's in the middle of something. And she resents that. Or you burst in on her at 8 o'clock in the morning before she's even had a chance to take her coat off. And she resents that. Or maybe, maybe the underlying structure is that she feels that the questions that you interrupt her with, you ought to be able to adjust yourself. Hmm. So, so you see those as structural things. So, we're, so you see those as structural, and therefore, if we could identify those, it's really a root cause analysis almost, or at least it seems to sound like that. Well, root cause, systemic root cause analysis is closely related. Um, let me give you another example. Um, you go in the shower in the morning, and this was an example that Susan wanted to to use. So I'm sorry she's not here tonight, yeah. but let me see if I can let me see if I can uh, do it do it, it justice without her. You go in the shower, and uh, you turn on the water, you, you set the temperature to where you think it's going to be, and it's too hot. So you switch the knob to colder. And what happens? Nothing, because it tapes, takes time to react, okay? So right. you, you twist it too far to the left, okay? You wait, and now all of a sudden it's freezing cold because of the delay. How do you react? You twist the knob all the way to the right. What happens? Nothing, because there's a delay. So you twist it harder to the right, okay? And now you're burning up again. And because of the delays in the system, you keep overcorrecting, and what you end up with is an oscillation. Here's another way to look at it, a, a similar physical example. Let's say you're driving your car. The road turns to the left. You turn the steering wheel to the left, and the car goes to the left, follows the road. Everything works perfectly. Now, suppose you had a Fercocta steering wheel, and mm. there was a delay in the reaction of the steering wheel, okay? So you see the road turn to the left. You turn the wheel to the left. Nothing happens. Car keeps going straight. You say, oh, my God, I'm going to drive off the road. You crank the wheel over hard to the left, okay? Now, finally, the car starts to catch up. The car turns left, turns too far to the left because mm. it's caught up. And what do you do? You crank the wheel over to the right. What happens? Nothing, because the delay. So your reaction is to crank it further over to the right. And now it catches up. And instead of going smoothly following the path of the road, you end up zigzagging across the road. And again, you get this oscillation. So oscillations are characteristic of systems that have feedback with delays. And you see it all over. You see it in uh, the position of the lakes pine cone. You see it in zebra stripes. You see it in predator-prey relationships, where predator-prey relationships, the, the quantity of predator and prey will oscillate over time, again, because of these delays. And delays are almost inevitable. They're built into the world. In fact, and that's because of the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And in fact, if you have a spring on a bob, a bob on a spring, I should say, okay, why does it oscillate? Why doesn't it just move to its equilibrium position? Well, it's because you have a force, the force of gravity and the spring constant acting on the mass and the position of the mass impacting the force acting on the mass in a feedback loop. Now, the position impacts the force in instantaneously, but the force does not impact the position instantaneously because of inertia. There's a delay be be before the force can actually cause that bob to move. So there's a delay, and that's why the sucker bobs up and down. If there were no delay and he held the mass here, it would automatically move right to its equilibrium position and stay there. So oscillations are indications of feedback loops with delays. That's the structure. I like you introduced the word equilibrium because as you were describing that, I was thinking of my own background in economics, this concept of supply equals demand at a price and, uh, at, you know, or a cost, depending on how you're looking at it. And the interesting thing is, is we can, uh, generally speaking, in, in our history, we don't actually know what that is. It's a theoretical space because we oscillate around it. You, you adjust the price until you're wrong, which you only know after you get feedback. 
The question is how rapid can you get your market feedback and hence agile marketing marketing which is the idea that you can get rapid aim for rapid feedback so you cut that oscillation you have frequency down right and so that you're very quickly getting in on where your equilibrium is and that's a that's been a fundamental problem in economics in a way right there's a theoretical equilibrium but you're never there because <laughs> you're always just missing it on your best day and it's because of a feedback loop so we actually see that happening out uh, for us as we're looking at pricing services, for example, to the market. That's a terrific example, Kendall. And in fact, you see oscillations in, in the economy all the time, uh, both in macro and in microeconomics, right? Uh, as the supply and demand vary, they will oscillate with each other over time. And that's systems thinking. That, and that's uh, again, and apparently our logo will oscillate bouncing in here. I see. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and, and again, the, the structural aspect of it is you have feedback loops with delays. So let's talk about that from a project management perspective for just a second before we bring Harry in here. Um, why does this, you know, qui bono? Who, who's going to be helped? Who's who's improved by understanding this? If I'm looking at it from a management perspective or the delivery of a project, or indeed project management. <laughs> Right. Um, how does seeing the world this way help me or help me change how I will improve delivery? What would be an example to start seeing that? And then we'll bring Harry in here to talk some more about this. Well, OK, suppose you are an environmental project manager. Mm. And your job is to reduce the threat of spruce budworm in destroying the spruce crop in Alberta. Okay. Okay, because what's happened is the spruce budworm is now really proliferating and it's eating and killing all these profitable timber trees. So you've been hired as an environmental ecologist to fix the problem. So you go in there and you say, okay, let's get a bunch of pesticide and let's spray the entire forest and you spray the entire forest. And Eureka, it kills all the spruce budworms. The trees start to bounce back and you say, oh, pay me money, I did a good job. Mm. Well, that works for a year or two. And now with no spruce budworm to control the population of spruce, the spruce proliferate. And they proliferate and they proliferate. They have incredible volumes of spruce. Well, guess what? Now the budworm bounces back. It says all these, this wonderful volume of food to eat. So they propagate like mad. And now, whereas previously, the spruce and the spruce budworm were in equilibrium, oscillating over time, over some narrow range. Now you've created an oscillation that is much greater. And you have feast and famine. And that's because of a failure to understand the cause and effect relationships among the spruce, among the predator and the prey. So that's one good example of, of how this would help a project manager. Let me give you another example. And let me bring in uh, another element of systems thinking. And that is in systems thinking, you have to understand the boundaries of your system very well. What's in the yeah, system. Yeah, you mentioned you boundaries. Count, yeah, what you should count in and what you should count out. So. Relevance to project management. So Raphael Vignoli is an excellent architect, South American architect. He designed a hotel in Las Vegas um, called the Vidara, Vidara Hotel, V-D-A-R-A. This was back in uh, 2008. It's a beautiful hotel. It's a skyscraper in the desert. It's got a very shiny aluminum facade, and the facade is concave. Beautiful building to look at. Well, one day in the summertime, a couple of people are sitting around the pool area at the base of the hotel. And one says to the other, hey, do you smell something burning? And the other one says, yeah, yeah, it smells like hair. And the first one says, yeah, it's my hair. And her hair was burning. Why? Because on certain days of the year, the position of the sun was just so that the Vidara Hotel facade focused the sun's rays down onto this area right around the pool at the base of the hotel, creating temperatures of 140, 150 degrees. 
Wow. It costs millions of dollars to try to fix the problem. They've tried putting louvers on the facade, tried putting uh, dark material on the facade, everything. Now, what was the problem? The problem was a lack of systems thinking. Vignoli did not define his system properly. He forgot that the sun is also a component of the system and interacts with the building that he built. So a big problem, failure to bound the system properly. Now, I just want to tell you a little rejoinder because Vignoli made the same mistake six years later when he designed a skyscraper in London called 20, 20 Fenchurch Street. <coughs> Pardon me. Another beautiful building with a concave, shiny facade. Well, Guy parks his car uh, in front of the building and he comes oh, no. out. He comes out and the mirror has melted off the car. The shop windows uh, right next to the car uh, are popping out of their out of their seats because of the solar expansion, the solar heat. And again, it's the same thing. At certain times of the day in the summertime, the sun is at the just right at just at the right angle, so that the rays impact the facade of Twenty Fenchard Street, Twenty Fenchard Street, and fry stuff across the street. They nicknamed the building Fry Scraper or the Walkie Scorcher. <laughs> so there's real impact by our design when we don't accommodate thinking of this as a system then. Yes, uh, and you would, think that, you, you would think that Vignoli would have learned his, his lesson with the Vidara Hotel, right? But evidently not. Uh, or I would say to my project managers, you'd think the stakeholders who hired him would have learned their lesson. But with that, I'm going to bring in Harry here. So Harry Zolkauer, step on up here. Let's bring out our returning systems thinker, Harry Zolkauer, um, himself a visionary in the space. I remember the, uh, what was it, uh, Punk PM? And uh, we also have him as the uh, head uh, chapter president of Southern Maryland. So, Harry, you were hanging out there in the field of chat. So before we release both of you into the field of the fields of practicality here for a second, what did you see in the chat that we need to reference here or consider? What was uh, what was your yeah. take on the chat? I think um, if we could point to Orlando's got a uh, comment about uh, traceability um, and oh. requirements. Yeah. So, you know, looking at from a perspective of being able to, uh, you know, take the decomposition of something and tie it to something that's bigger than that, I think is really the more of a comment than I think a question uh, from Orlando. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. He said, what becomes evident is, you know, the parts uh, connected to the whole and also uh, connect, connected to that, <laughs> um, I was thinking about uh, really thinking about agile and just the whole notion of that. You know, looking at one of the challenges I think of be, you know being in a in an agile kind of um, framework is that, and I've noticed this with demos, for example, is that. Oftentimes what happens if you have two or three weeks sprints, you're only the, the client is only seeing a piece. You're not seeing like the, the, uh -huh. like the big picture. And I think a lot of times it gets very confusing for the user or the client or both to know what the big picture is, how everything is flowing. And I think that's one of the, you know, the, the weaknesses of, of that scrum agile approach of incrementalism. Uh, is not you know seeing more the how how everything works together. I'm uh, I, uh, do I have my my mic back? We're, we've got Dan in the God Pod there. Is he giving me my mic back? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, I like what you just said there because it was, I was doing some of the reading uh, that you guys had pr produced before. And this idea that you can't dissect the system to understand the system, because then we end up inside it a bit, I think is one comment. The other one is, you, for I call it losing context. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because that sounds threatening almost to me from a PM perspective, given that we focus a lot on work breakdown structures, um, value breakdown structures, benefits, risk. We, we do a lot of decomposition. It's, we're very Aristot Aristotelian, uh, and very uh breaking down a complex thought sometimes there's purpose to that but what i'm hearing is is that that could lead us a bit astray in understanding either the causation what you call traceability there the ability to see those effects talk to me a little bit about that uh then jamie coming from that direction 
if in fact we can't understand the system by breaking it down, I'm assuming there's still a good reason for breaking things down, but what should we do about that? There's such an emphasis in project management on decomposition. Decomposition has its place. And uh -huh. dissection, and dissection and decomposition have served us very, very well for the past 300 years since the scientific revolution, however many years that's been. Served us very well. But when you decompose a system, you are losing the interconnections among the elements. Those interconnections very often dominate systemic performance. So in a sense, yeah, the Scrum Agile concept is antithetical to systems thinking, but it's really not. It's really not provided, <laughs> pro provided, you know, you know, because look in, in, in systems thinking, we use a systems breakdown structure to understand all the components of the system. But then we carefully go back and look at all the interconnections and interactions between all among all the components of the system and between the components of the system and the environment equally important. So yeah, look, I like to understand stuff by, by dissecting it too. But then you got to put it back together and study those relationships if you really want to understand system performance. Yeah, I, I like that point. Um, something that you quoted in your article, which is a quote from, uh, I guess, Gerald Weinberg in his essentially seminal thinking on this was, why do I see what I see? Why do things stay the, stay the same? And why do they change? And I think that's that's almost like the tell for me to say, I'm seeing, you know, I've got the plan, we're all working the plan and something changed. And what I think you're getting at is understanding the underlying pattern about why that might have changed. It's trying to give us insight into some sort of core concepts. I don't know, Harry, you're nodding there. Yeah, Kendall, I'd like to kind of introduce another layer to this or angle. And that is, and I've been thinking about this, uh, Jamie, while you were talking, there are things that are within our control um, as a mm. project manager when we're looking at a system. And there are things that are outside the locus of our control. And I think that's that's important to recognize, accept in, in many cases. And in other cases, looking at it from what is it that I can turn around that may be institutionalized that uh, perhaps I could, you know, influence or change. But there are certain things that are just outside of your, your locus of control. Um, and I think that's important to recognize uh, rather than trying, you know, to beat your head against the wall. Uh, there, a lot of examples are, you know, for, for those of us that are working as contractors for, you know, government agencies, there are certain policies in place. There are certain patterns, as you put it, that, uh, uh, you know, underlying structures that are immovable. Um, and so I think the reality is project managers, we have to, we have to adjust and, and adapt to those things. Um, and a lot of, I think what we have to do as project managers is adaptation of based on the situation, what the system that we're working in within the confines of what we can control and recognizing what we can't control. Yeah, Jamie, I would, I would, pat, I would map that back to your comments in this sense, understand an underlying structure. And as a PM, the problem is I can't, I, I may not have the authority, the view, or the reason to be trying to change all the structures, the things that I'm not in my control. You mentioned influence, Harry. I like that. The question to me is like, I always want to look to see what is an underlying structure causing what I'm seeing and can I influence it? And to me, that's usually what I can, this as far as I can get is, can I even influence it and in understanding that? So that I would take his concept of what can I control and what I cannot control being at the layer of seeing the structure that's driving the pattern I'm seeing. Does that make sense to you as a way of seeing it? Because I, I try and think of it as influencing the structure I'm in. I think it's a terrific point. Um, in systems thinking, it's important to identify the leverage points in the system. Ah, and okay. and typically, typically, there is more than one. And as Harry points out so accurately, hey, a lot of them you can't do anything about. A lot of them are outside of your control. But identify those that are within your control where you can have some leverage over the system behavior. Yeah. 
Uh, it made me think of the, you know, when bad things happen to good projects, are we just going to say, well, that was the system, <laughs> right? There's a larger system that we can't see. Indeed, the matrix, maybe, I don't know, but we all know there's this stuff like it just happens, right? And uh, what are you going to do? Sometimes it's just, a, it's just an event. Um, I, I'm trying to think of some more examples around project management when we run into problems. I see it in the relationship, again, of the organizations that projects are embedded in. Uh, Jamie, you mentioned it in terms of the outcomes of a project, the example of the um, uh, arboreal treatments um, that, that you were talking about, right? That's actually the purpose of the uh, the outcome of the project. Where else have you seen them from a from a take that we can see from a project management perspective? How would that walk us out of either risk or stakeholder engagement. Those are two well, big things for project managers. Well, well, well let, let me give you another excellent, albeit terrible example. And, and Kendall, this may be get, getting at what you're looking for. Um, again, it's it's critically important that you understand the boundaries of the system and identify them mm -hmm. accurately. So Bhopal, India was the site mm -hmm. of a union carbide pesticide plant. Um, I, I think it goes back 30 years or so. And it was a horrible accident uh, that killed 12,000 of the local inhabitants of Bhopal. Horrible accident, chemical accident. What happened was they had designed the pesticide plant. You know, it's a very complicated plant with a lot of reaction vessels and containers and vents, etc. They had a particular reaction vessel, and they realized that there was a chance that somebody might inadvertently mix two chemicals in that reaction vessel that would create an exothermic reaction and create an explosion. And they said, we don't want an explosion, so let's put a, um, a pressure relief valve on that reaction vessel and vent it. And they did that. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. Um, some, uh, somebody opened the wrong valve, and two chemicals that shouldn't have been mixed together got mixed together, created a strongly exothermic reaction. There would have been ex an explosion, except the pressure relief valve opened, venting all the gases to the atmosphere. Unfortunately... Wow. The gases were highly toxic, and they killed 12,000 mm. people in the village of Bhopal. The system worked perf perfectly if you want to define the system as the confines of the pesticide plant. If you define the system as the confines of the pesticide plant plus the environment, it was a dramatic failure because of the failure to identify the boundaries of the system properly. Does that help, Kendall? With another good example that's really interesting to see that because what you just described there is strictly speaking not a failure the system performed the way it was designed to uh, i don't know how failure is discussed in this context but the system did what it was supposed to do and what you're saying is yeah and it wasn't designed well from a systems thinking and you would put that in the context of not understanding the boundary what is the full-blown yes. context of yes of the, of the plant Yes, huh. exactly. So it's like it's like we need to think about big enough wrappers around our project. We're back to what does my project serve within the organization, I think. That may be where that goes. I don't know. How do you see that from an agile perspective? As you mentioned, there's a there's a trap in agile in a way, but we're also trying to see it within context. And I think the reason agile does the breaking down the pieces and for that rapid turnaround is because you're trying to get the customer involvement. It seems to have an idea that the customer is aware of the structure. Or the purposes. I don't know. Ad, uh, how would you walk system structure for agile in that context, Harry? Uh, I think simply a couple of things. One is using a, a roadmap and looking at the big mm. picture, just keeping that in front of the uh, the user, the client, you know, so that they don't lose perspective um, based on each demo. And I've experienced it firsthand where the uh, you know, the client, the one that's putting together the user stories, the business owner, they are just, you know, it doesn't make sense because we're just chunking out work and, and functionality, I should say. And so uh, the challenge in the demos or doing user acceptance testing, and this is software, of course, uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, we don't demo, for the most part, as we're iterating, we're not end to end showing end to end until the very end of the project um and, and so that's kind of a restrictive thing so it's a lot of using your imagination you know okay so we're we're only doing a chunk of things but you know what we're designing is this whole you know whole whole thing you know this whole functionality or multiple things within this functionality or multiple functionalities 
So I think that's the challenge um, is, is to try to give the big picture, the, the more holistic view of things. Um, so I guess so that's, communication, that's, so being able to, to vo overvoice that would help defeat the problem of over decomposition, if you will, or the breaking down into yeah. the component pieces to do it. So I want to go back to the thing then um, as we kind of look at our last major topic here, Jamie, you had mentioned is the most exciting thing to you was the emergent probability. Uh, I'm sorry, emergent possibilities, the emergent outcomes that happen uh, in uh, really the functioning that could happen. How could we use the concept of emergence within our project management teams and delivery of projects? I'm inviting a little brainstorming on that there, because that was a key characteristic that is an outcome of seeing the world of systems and of systems operating. You said that was kind of a characteristic of when you see it. So if it's true that we tend to see emergent properties coming out of systems and our projects are within systems and are themselves systems, where would we see this emergent property coming or where could we see, I almost see it as like pressure where this could start happening. Behaviors are beginning to form. How do I use that to my advantage as a project manager? And I don't mean to manipulate people, but I mean to get to the goals that we're after together. How can we harness emergent properties? Well, it's hard. And it's hard specifically because they're not predictable based on characteristics of the components. There are emergent properties of systems, for example, like reliability. How oh, tell me can more you, there. I don't see that. How can you anticipate reliability of an electromechanical system, for example, based on the performance of its individual components? You can to a mm. degree, right? if you use high quality parts, but you still can't anticipate exactly how they're going to interrelate. Um, usability, serviceability. Those are emergent characteristics of the of the system. So in, as project okay. managers, um, again, I'm just brainstorming as you asked. The, I think the yeah, best yeah, you can yeah. do is be aware that emergent properties occur and look in places where they have already occurred. Sometimes they're positive. More often than not, they're negative. So look at those negative um, emergent properties and see if there's a possibility that they're going to be replicated in the project that you happen to be working on. I'm gonna hypothesize something here. If I looked at a project manager analogous to a goose, I would never predict that it would fly in a V shape. I look at a project manager and now I've got this project manager who is so amazing in the context that they're in, the goose that figures out the V. It's an emergent property on that. This begins to sound to me like, in the context of the geese even, what we would call culture. It's the pattern of behaviors that I see among the people. So I'm not going to the product that's being developed, but rather by the people that are executing project management and are the key stakeholders to the project managers in the system that they're in, involved in. How can I see emergent behavior and use it in that context? In terms so, of my relationship and communications management, I see my lead SME and I see a goose, but I need to be aware mm -mm, he will fly, she will fly in some new pattern as soon as we're so, released into our project wild. <laughs> uh, so a wonderful question. And um, again, it's very difficult, but I'm not going to use this as an, ex as an excuse for not answering. If you look, <laughs> if you look at some of the great, rock bands the beatles uh -huh. for example the beatles for example harry the musician is listening <laughs> so the beatles were not great individual musicians in fact when somebody asked john lennon if ringo Starr was the best drummer he'd ever played with if ringo Starr was the best drummer in the world <laughs> lennon replied heck he's not even the best drummer in the beatles so Ooh. so they weren't great yeah. musicians what made the Beatles great was the tension between Lennon and McCartney, between Lennon's lyrics and personality and McCartney's music and personality. Okay, so put that as aside for a moment. The wonderfulness of the Beatles was an emergent property. Now, if you look at one of the greatest football teams of all time, and boy, I'm on thin ice here because I'm in Massachusetts and you guys are down there, the New England Patriots, Tom Brady was a great quarterback, whether you like him or not. Randy Moss was a great wide receiver, whether you like him or not. When you put these two guys together, 
They were spectacular because of the relationship, the trust relationship that developed between, between these two guys. You could not anticipate that. Moss had been a problem child where he played earlier. Suddenly he gets together with Tom Brady and the offensive line and everything clicks. Emergent properties. Okay, so these emergent properties do exist on a personality basis among team members. You know, people have been trying to figure it out and anticipate the emergent property of love for millions of, well, for thousands of years, right? <laughs> people, people try to uh, develop these um, algorithms that they ask all sorts of questions and all sorts of questions. They say, okay, these two are going to mesh together. It never works. No one has been successful. It's because love is an emergent property that no one has been able to properly articulate, understand. The same, unfortunately, is often true with uh, teammates. Now, you can look at teammates and say, okay, this guy's open-minded. This guy uh, likes getting his work done early. They're probably going to work well together. And half the time that works and half the time it doesn't. So, again, can you use the the property of emergence to put together a good project team i doubt it i doubt it but you can probably do pretty well to recognize that the way teams work together is an emergent property and be sensitive to that well an entire industry of people who design team building saying i know i can build your team just got wiped out. You guys all heard it here on this YouTube presentation here tonight. We cannot know how a team will work together. It is emergent. We can't predict it by definition. Um, although you did give us a little heads up on this. You said, when have you seen it before? You said you pattern. can kind of get a sense of how it's happened before, some sort of pattern of patterns, if you will, right? So uh, maybe when were you last on a good team? It would be an interesting question. But this, this dialogue of how we can assemble the best team Sounds like a self-defeating question. Harry, what are you thinking? What are you hearing there as somebody who works on oh. software team? Oh, this, yeah. I mean, not to reveal too much, but that just, just happened to me where I had a team that was great. True was talks great with project team. managers, people, right here. Some true talk. <laughs> and so anyway, there was some good, I think there's a lot to be said with good chemistry between individuals within a team that carries a lot of weight there's like a there's like a, a rhythm there's it just flows better and people know what to expect and whatnot so there's a lot to be said of the chemistry of a team and how successful that can be um i think it's just recently it just came to life for me anyway so Is so there anything you see? oh go ahead jamie so i'm i'm really glad harry used that word chemistry what do you mean by chemistry? It's an undefined term. And what it means is the emergence of a relationship. And some people, you know, producers, movie producers and directors try to do this all the time. They try to put together a male and a female co-star who are going to have good chemistry. And sometimes it works and sometimes it fails miserably. There, there are stories both ways. It's almost impossible to predict. But yeah, chemistry is the same as this emergent characteristic of teamwork almost the only thing i can begin to think there is we can have tools for the underlying pattern to see what could happen giving it opportunity the goose can only fly in a v when there's three of them and they're together otherwise you don't got to be so you there's some level of i can try it seems and put teams together to allow them to experience whatever will emerge and then it sounds like we need to monitor for that yeah, for sure. Do you know the best way to assemble a great team, team that works well together? Hmm. Assemble the same team that's worked together previously. There's your signal. Well, there you go, team. We just heard all of that right here. So I, uh, I appreciate that a lot. Um, is there anything else in the chat that somebody happened to ask about or would like to have you guys uh, approach from a practical and theoretical point of view? Anybody put anything else in there? I didn't get accused. I wasn't sure. I think we covered sort of the heart of things. Um, I look at yeah. it now. So, well, I don't want us to throw up our hands and say, well, we couldn't help it because it was just a system happening, but it sounds like we can stay observant and 
mm, check for what's going wrong or what's going right and see if we can replicate in those cases by looking at underlying patterns to it, which are itself driven by structures. I mean, I think that's what we're saying. And it seems to me as project managers, we could probably set structures. It's just we don't know what those like outcomes will be. But we do own structures, I believe. The relationship of reporting, the relationship of handoffs between silos or between work streams. Am I wrong? Am I right? I mean, we get Definitely. to play in that space, right? Project managers. You're, you're exactly right. And bear in mind that structures derive from underlying mental models. For, yeah. for example, the uh, hierarchical structure of an organization, of a typical organization, derives from the underlying mental model that human beings can, mo can manage at most about 10 other individuals. So this individual <laughs> manages 10, those individuals man manage 10, and that results in the hierarchical structure. So was that structure intentional? To a degree, okay, but what are the unintended consequences of that structure? Here's another mental model. Um, Incentive compensation increases productivity. Uh. Okay, that's a, that's a very widely held uh, mental model. As a result of that, we establish a compensation compensation structure, wherein people who sell more or who produce more get paid more. That's a good thing, right? Until hmm. people start stealing the productivity of their colleagues, right? And now it's be, it's become destructive and detrimental. So. There's nothing wrong with the underlying mental model, but the resulting structure may have unintended consequences, and you have to be careful about that. Well, you just hit something interesting there. If it's a mental model, that means we all own it individually, which means to me then it's check your assumptions of your mental model. Before I maybe worry about the entire structure around me, I might want to ask what do I think I'm seeing and, and what are my assumptions underneath that as a model? That is, there. that is a wonderful idea. And ask everybody with whom you're working, what is their mental model also? Get your mental models exposed. Put them all on the table. Be amazing how many irritations or, or arguments can be avoided by just exposing your mental models. I would love to know what the mental model underneath an agile uh, scrum team would be. How would you describe that? Harry. How can we begin to understand that? No, I mean, because it's mental, this is really complex thinking here. So what would that, what is a mental model that's that, a set of assumptions even that, that drive a team like that or cause a team to function like that? So the mental model is that, I'm just, I'm just speculating. Mental model is that yeah, hey, model. You know, when you, when you chunk projects, software projects fine enough and the scrum team gets together every day and discusses their issues, well, you can address problems quickly, you can effect solutions quickly, and you can close the lines of, excuse me, open the lines of communication, shorten the lines of communication, and therefore more effectively get things done. I would guess that that's, those are the fundamentals of the model. Harry, what do you think? Yeah, I think that sounds right. Um, you know, there are other concepts too that I think uh, are interesting, like fail fast, <laughs> which, to me is, is a interesting concept of, of, you know, agile is, you know, okay, let's, let's experiment, let's do something, let's fail fast uh, is, you know, for some teams that is part of the, the you know, sort of the mental uh, way of thinking. Um, I don't kind of think that way because when you hear the term, you know, <laughs> failure, you know, you, you have an immediate reaction. So you have team members who may be interpreting differently. So we're back down to a concepts of interpretation, but again, through a systems thinking, understanding that we're part of a larger system, if you will. So yeah. I think that would be, to me, that's the lesson to take away from here is to see it, to have a chance to, for those who are not intuitive to it, to see it structurally that we need to look at it as mental models. That's only almost like a belief system, a way of it thinking it should be. Then we design to that and then we see patterns of behavior or outcomes from that, which have implications for outcomes from that i mean to me agile is one of the mental model is that the customer is so important you get the customer in early and they have focused that very very much at possibly the detriment of other things we don't know but that is definitely a belief or a mental model to me in there um from where i'm seeing it it, it is well, if, if 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 i may leave you with one sort of ending yes, point do. if you're working on one of these teams working on any project team and you say be, a behavior pattern 
like your boss blowing up at you every day. <laughs> Don't just accept it. There is a structural reason for it. And it behooves you as a systems thinker to, under, to figure out and understand what that structural reason is. And then you may or may not be able to do something about it, but at least you'll understand what is causing the behavior. Harry, last thought? No, I think that makes perfect sense. And, and um, not only recognizing it, but also addressing it fast is, is the other thing. Um, you know, it's one thing to finally see the pattern, but if you wait, and I've done this myself, where I'm so busy and I've got other things going on, you know, whatever that you're seeing as, a, as an issue to address, you know, try to address it very quickly. Uh, whether you're in an agile, doesn't matter, any team setting, you know, just make sure that not only do you notice what's happening, but to act on it fast. Excellent. Well, thank you. We'll leave it with that. So patterns come from structures. Structures come from mental models. And lo and behold, we face time, which I'm going to argue is a mental model for right now. So an intellectual <laughs> construct such that it is, we have run out of it, that being time, and find ourselves bound to it and headed for the exit. So um, thank you both for a second round, a second bite at the apple at True Talks here tonight for both of you coming back. I'm glad you were able to. I appreciate it a lot. Um, PMs, guess what? There's this whole structure that produces PDUs, which is probably why some of you are watching this show here tonight. So your behavior may be driven by the PMI constructs <laughs> and system itself. So the PDU CSRS or certification system is probably a big driver for a lot of uh, the behavior that we see. With that, I'll turn it over to Beth to tell us a little bit more about how that's gonna happen for us. Thanks a lot. Take us out, Beth. Sure, thanks. Uh, PDUs are self-reported. So if you're watching live tonight or if you're watching on demand, the recorded video, you are eligible to self-report one PDU. And I'd like to tell you about some upcoming events. Our next True Talks show will be on March 22nd. Please hold the time 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern on March 22nd for the next True Talks. And there are a couple of PMI WDC events that I'd like to tell you about on February 6th at the Capital One Arena. There will be a networking activity at the Wizards game. Wizards play the Cavs. And on February 15th, this is not yet posted on the PMI WDC site. Uh, the February 6th event is, you can get more details there and you see it on the screen now. Uh, to be posted on the same site soon is a February 15th event. It is the monthly dinner meeting with three components. It will be at the Ronald Reagan International Trade Center in Washington, DC. It will include a membership orientation, a PM tools talk, and a dinner speaker. And then finally, I have to mention that on February 18th, we will have the I think it's the eighth annual or ninth annual, ninth annual DC Regional Project Management Day of Service, PIMDOS. Registration is currently open for PMs and for nonprofits and registration closes in two weeks. So please go ahead and sign up for that at the our website, uh, www.pm, the number four, change.org, www.pm, the number four, change.org and look in events, upcoming events, and you'll see the PIMDOS. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. Washington, D.C. Regional, that top one. Click on that, and you'll find the registration link. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion on systems thinking. <laughs>